Hello and welcome back to the channel. As always, I'm your host, Morgan. Recently, we talked about the fascinating history of Grand Teton National Park. So today I thought it would be fun to crack open the history book one more time, even though I'm more of an ecologist than a historian, and talk about the tale of Capitol Reef National Park and how this little spot of the desert became what it is today. So let's start with the prehistoric beginnings. Capitol Reef National Park is in the state of Utah, and in the state of Utah, there's evidence of human activities dating back to about 12,000 years ago. These first humans lived during the Paleo-Indian period, and they likely lived primarily in rock shelters and caves, and they hunted using projectiles to capture small animals, as well as megafauna-like mammoths. Unfortunately, the climate began to change, and so these ancient humans had to adapt, which led up to the Archaic period from 8,000 to 1,600 years ago. And this was a period of hunting and gathering. And essentially, that's one of the things that just defines the culture of the time. So from here, we can fast forward to what is known as Fremont culture. And Fremont culture was thriving from 300 to 1300 Common Era, or CE. And the big thing about Fremont culture was that it incorporated farming into the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, specifically farming crops like corn, beans, and squash along riverbanks, so where water was plentiful, which is important if you live in a desert. The evidence of the Fremont culture is found throughout the state of Utah and also into parts of Idaho, Colorado, and Nevada, so the bordering areas. These people likely lived in rock shelters and pit houses, and one notable thing about them is that they created pictographs and petroglyphs. The distinction between these two being that one is paint on rock and the other is carved. And over time, Fremont culture kind of shuffled and moved around and became the Native American cultures that we are more familiar with if we look back into the history books. So moving on, we're going to fast forward to some notable exploration by people of European descent, since there's just more stuff to talk about here. And that will get us to how the national park became a national park. Let's begin in 1776 with an expedition done by Francisco Atanizo Dominguez and Silvestre Velez de Escalante. I apologize about pronunciation, I'm doing my best. So these gentlemen were Franciscan priests looking for a route to the missions in Monterey, California. A uh, quick Side note here, if you're unaware, there's a series of missions that were established by Spaniards in California along the coast with the goal to Christianize the native peoples. If you grew up in California, you're pretty comfortable with the idea of these missions because in either third or fourth grade, I don't remember which, it's a big part of your history. So... Moving on with more about this expedition, even though they were trying to get to California, one thing that they did was that they made very detailed notes about their travels, especially their travels through Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, which was pretty helpful since there wasn't a whole lot detailed about these areas of North America yet. And on their travels, they befriended the Ute tribes by presenting them with gifts and promising to teach them how to farm and raise livestock, which big deal, especially if your agriculture is primarily raising crops, adding livestock in there is kind of a big plus. But from here, we have to fast forward all the way to 1853 and the expedition run by John Charles Fremont. So Fremont traveled through Utah and Colorado because he was looking for a route for a northern railroad to get to the Pacific Ocean. Remember, at this time, railroads were all the rage, so it's a big deal to have a northern route to connect east to west, and that's what he was looking for. 
One big thing that makes this expedition so notable for this area specifically is that he hired a daguerreotypist. Now, what is a daguerreotypist, you may asking? Well, it's someone who takes daguerreotypes, and that's just a type of photograph. Now, his daguerreotypist was Solomon Nunez Carvalho, and he took nearly 300 of these images on this expedition. Unfortunately, most of the images burned up in a fire shortly after the expedition, but there are some that still exist that show notable features in Capitol Reef National Park that you can see on the Capitol Reef website, and they are pretty cool to look at. So this expedition was very tough, and because of how tough it was, they had to resort to eating their horses and... It was not really great on their morale. That is until they came upon a Mormon settlement and that kind of helped them get back on their feet. And now that we've mentioned this, we're gonna move on to the explorations of John Wesley Powell. Just remember that it was a Mormon settlement that saved that expedition. That's gonna be relevant later in our discussion. But, who was John Wesley Powell? Well, he was a former Union Army major and also an avid naturalist. And if you don't know what a naturalist is, basically a naturalist is what would become an ecologist eventually. So he teamed up with geologists and geographers to explore the Colorado River. He did a lot of exploration down the river into the Grand Canyon and places like that. But we're interested in his expedition that took place between 1871 to 1872, because that was what explored the Capitol Reef region specifically. On this expedition, he had with him geologists Clarence Dutton and Grove Carl Gilbert and topographer Almond Thompson. And throughout the course of their explorations, they actually ended up naming the Water Pocket Fold because it's an area of the park where a lot of water collects, which makes sense that it would be named Water Pocket Fold because the water tends to collect in little pockets. But now that we've talked about some of the notable expeditions that took place, let's talk about the settlers. So who was crazy enough to settle in this desertous region? Well, most of the settlers were sent by officials from the Mormon church in Salt Lake City to establish missions in these remote areas of the Western territories. In 1866, the Mormon expeditions first reached these Western high valleys, and then in 1870, they began to settle. They established the towns of Junction, which became Frutia, Clifton, Giles, Elephant, Aldridge, Caneville, and Hanksville. And this was the time that the Powell expeditions were taking place. And with all these Mormon settlements popping up, that's why other expeditions were able to stumble across them and basically get a little bit of salvation from the dire circumstances they found themselves in. Now, of course, it wasn't only these Mormon settlements popping up. There were other settlements that also began forming, especially along the Fremont River, which is the river that does run through the area. And the settlements that are notable are Fremont, Lyman, Bicknell, and Torrey. So this brings us to 1880, when a man by the name of Nels Johnson moved to Frutia. He planted the first orchards, and that is a big deal. The orchards he planted were apples, peaches, pears, plums, walnuts, and almonds, and they're still a big deal in the park today. And if you go at the right seasons, you can even take part in the harvesting of these orchards. I'm not going in any of those seasons, but I hear that it's a cool thing. And another thing that he's kind of known for was marrying 17-year-old Mary Jane Buman. Bunin, sorry, they're N's, not M's, who was the daughter of a notable Frutia resident, Elijah Cutler Bunin. Now, Elijah Cutler Bunin was a man who led a group of pioneers to create a wagon trail through the Capitol Gorge 
which basically allowed settlers, church officials, miners, and outlaws to pass through the water pocket bowl, which really opened up the area to new people. And in 1896, he actually donated land for the Frutia schoolhouse. His 12-year-old daughter, Nettie, became the first teacher at that schoolhouse, and the schoolhouse remained open until 1941, when students began to be bused to Tory as the schools were kind of consolidated. And he did build a small cabin that you can still see today as it stands along Utah Highway 24 which is kind of cool. A lot of the buildings in the area in Frutia, which Frutias were the main campground and the orchards and all that are. So it's kind of the main hub in Capitol Reef Natural Park. A lot of those historic buildings are still there. Of course, the time of settlers had to eventually come to a close, especially as the communities were starting to grow and students were even being bused into another town for school. So who were the last settlers? Well, one family that we're going to talk about is Dewey Gifford, his wife, Nell, and their four children. They're essentially the last settlers of the region. They lived in a two-story house along the Fremont River that is now known as the Gifford House and is still a historical site to this day. They farmed orchards. Dewey worked on a state road crew, and eventually they ran a motel to accommodate the tourists that were beginning to visit the area. And then when Dewey and Nell reached their 60s, they eventually moved to Torrey, and they were the last settlers to leave the area. And it's important to note here that this floodplain only ever supported 10 families at once, so the land did quite frequently change hands. So people were constantly moving in and out of the area. So let's talk about the road to establishing the National Park, now that we've kind of talked about the exploration and the settlers in the area. This road begins in 1914 with entrepreneur Ephraim Portman Pechtol and his brother-in-law, who was a Utah legislative senator, Joseph S. Hickman. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to protect Capitol Reef as a state park. They appreciated both the natural and cultural value that they saw in the area, especially since they spent a lot of time exploring the water pocket fold and they wanted to make sure that was protected for generations to come. Now, they had hopes also that would end up boosting local economies, especially since Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon National Park had recently been established and ended up boosting economies in those areas. So it made sense to establish another park, even if it was only a state park, to protect the natural and cultural values that they saw there and boost the local economy. Now, unfortunately, shortly after the Utah legislature established the Board of State Park Commissioners, Hickman drowned in Fish Lake and with him, most of the support for the project was lost. That is until the 1930s. So in 1932, the National Park Service sent the then superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, Roger Toll, to visit the area. And after his visit, he reported back that it was worth future investigation. So good news for the Capitol Reef area. In 1933, Pechtel was eventually elected to the Utah legislature and he worked with Governor Henry Hooper Blood to sign a resolution to the United States Congress proposing boundaries for a new park. And at the same time, Pechtel was also writing to the National Park Superintendent, Horace Albright, encouraging him to establish either a national monument or a national park in the Capitol Reef area. So then Roger Toll, visited once again, and he ended up spending four days with Pechtel, just kind of exploring the area. So in 1935, after a couple of years of back and forth, after they established that there was reason to protect the area, there would be interest, they came up with the name, and the name was Capitol Reef National Monument. 
because they were originally just going to establish a national monument, not a national park. But then in 1937, FDR set aside 37,711 acres to be Capitol Reef National Monument. And it stayed that way until the 1970s when Capitol Reef officially became a national park. So it's not as exciting and controversial as the Grand Teton story, but I still think it's a pretty interesting tale because again, we also see an entrepreneur wanting to protect something just for the natural and cultural value view of it. And that's just so different from what we see with a lot of self-made businessmen and entrepreneurs today. And I may be a little jaded when I say that, but I just think tales like this are so great and so good. There's so much more fascinating history to come through though. So if you want more, I do highly recommend you start at that national parks link I have in the description down below that will take you straight to the history page for Capitol Reef. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, afternoon, evening, what have you. Have you been to Capitol Reef? Did you enjoy it? Do you like going to the desert? Do you have some more tidbits about its history you'd like us to know? Leave that all in the comments down below and I will see you all in the next one. Thank you again for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell if you would like to see more. And if you'd like to follow me on any of my other social medias, the links are down in the description below. Don't forget to check out thereptilegoth.com for all of my articles and blog posts. If you found any value in this video and you would like to help support the channel, please check out my Patreon page. That link is also in the description down below. And a special thanks goes out to my Diamond Dragon patron, Diane V. What you're doing is really helping me fund a dream here. I will see you guys all in the next one.